Hello, if you've just joined us tonight, welcome. Uh, welcome to Osteo Boston, Solution Seekers for Better Bone Health. And if you're in our live audience, I'm pretty excited to have you here because we're going to be introducing our speaker in a moment. And we just appreciate you. And if you're part of our YouTube audience, I wanna thank you for tuning in. And if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. If you want more like this, or if you like the content, uh, go ahead and subscribe and you'll get those these videos in your inbox. So um, I'd like to talk to you tonight about our speaker and then we'll present Dr. Charles Mamish. Um, <clears throat> Uh, he will be speaking tonight about molecular biophysical stimulation therapy, which is a non-invasive treatment approach using magnetic resonance to stimulate tissue regeneration and promote healing and osteoporosis. Uh, this treatment aims to improve bone density um, and potentially reduce our fracture risk. It's safe, it's painless, and it can be used alongside conventional treatments. Advocates believe that it offers benefits such as increased bone mineral density, improved bone strength, reduced pain, and an enhanced quality of life. It's been used in Germany since 1998, and it has gained traction across the rest of Europe uh, and several other countries as well. So tonight I would like to welcome our host of the our speaker of the evening and that is Dr. Charles Marmish who we will now call Charles and uh, let me go ahead and add you welcome Dr. Marmish and I think you're muted whoops I'm sorry you're muted okay uh, and now I'm off yeah okay now second try so um good afternoon um everyone um, um from germany it's already um 1 a.m in the morning here so night time and um i'm i'm very pleased to to join here tonight your um osteo boston talk and to um introduce or explain a little bit more about our mbst technique to you um i will have a few slides to start because there's a few things to um, explain. Um, I try to simplify things and I will also send the presentation to Shelley because there's a lot of articles and I don't think it makes sense to put down all the numbers or names. So you will have this one and then she will also have the articles and I think it's much better for you to read afterwards. So um, my idea was today to give you more a frame that you better understand what is the technique about um where it's currently applied and used and what are the first findings we have in osteoporosis and um and then leave enough room for questions and um saying this these questions are for us very important and um this is maybe the remark i want to start with that um i want to give you a little bit of background on the current situation um where we stand because um as um shelly mentioned um I am by myself um, working for a company called Lifco AB, which is similar to Berkshire Hathaway, not that size, but it's a similar system. So um, we're investing in small mid cap companies in Europe, um, all over Europe. And I having, let's say, more a uh, holding position, um, managing and running these companies. It's a um, very diversified portfolio, a um, lot of industry product companies, B2B. And we just acquired last October the company MBST, um, which has this special product. Um, I'm emphasizing this for two reasons. Number one, there could be later on a lot of questions why things were done the last years the way it was done. But this was more decisions from the former owner and entrepreneur, how he run things. And therefore, um, for me, it's more important to look in front what we plan and how we want to run. Um, the things in future and what are our ideas how um, to, to use it in medical treatment. And um, the second thing I want to also um, outline is that, um, which is very interesting for me, um, at, tonight there's meeting my two professional lives because on a background, I'm a medical doctor 
And um, I made my PhD in Boston on osteoarthritis and MRI imaging. So on a topic which is very connected. And then I, let's say, <laughs> run away from this professional life in 2009 and went to Siemens and then from Siemens to, to this company. So changing from medical to business. And now in October, I, I found this company which have a device who works in osteoarthritis. So I was um, more interested in all other companies. And therefore, I'm also very happy for tonight. I think it's after 14 years, the first presentation I'm giving on a medical scientific background. And maybe also I apologize a little bit Maybe it's not so smooth anymore in English as it was before. It was a long time, a little rusty, but um, um, I'm really happy to present you the data tonight. And uh, therefore, I will start with the slides now, and then I um, will leave room for discussions. But I don't know how it works regularly, but normally I would also like, if you have specific questions, to do it in between the slides. So we don't collect too much data or you stop if you want to have something explained more in detail. And is it okay to do it more interactive or? Um, well, um, if you'd like, I, what people could do just to make it quieter is they could put it in the chat. Yeah, sure. And that would be, and then cool. I'm sure yeah. you know what it is. Yeah, sure. So I would switch on now the presentation and then. Okay. Uh, So as I said, tonight, um, I want to give you an overview of this, um, the use of the electric uh, magnetic resonant effect um, for um, therapy and the current clinical status and how it potentially could use also in osteoporosis, which is the topic of your forum tonight. And objective tonight is giving you a background of um, electromagnetic resonance and how it can be used for therapy. And um, the more I prepared the presentation, the more I re realized how important this point is, because there's a lot of data outside on magnetic therapy and magnetic mattresses and magnetic field therapy. And it has the full variance from very voodoo type of therapies up to real therapies. And therefore, I think it's good to have a frame where these different um, words come from, which will help you in future if you if you think about these techniques, if you talk about the techniques to use the right wording and also describing the same technique. And then I um, would like to give you an overview of the current um, scientific studies and how it used clinically, especially in um, Europe. And then at the end, a current status on the research and the use in osteoporosis. And from there, I would love to go in an open discussion with you and answer your questions. Um, as already stated in the beginning, but I think um, important for this round, um, the product is not FDA approved yet and um, cannot be used in US. I think this is important. So um, tonight we will present something which is not yet registered or which you could um, use or do therapy in US. It's currently only um, registered on, on European FDA. And, or it depends also on the countries. Sometimes it's like a class one device. Sometimes it depends a little bit, but it's all registered and can be used. And, um, but not yet in US, but for sure, this is a um, short to mid term plan of, of the company to register it also in US and have it also um, there available for therapy in the United States. So magnetic therapy um, is, very old and um, it's already described in ancient times that um, magnetic fields are used for different concepts of therapy and not even magnetic fields, also um, electronic stimulation or electricity which induces um, magnetic fields. Um, Aristoteles in his um, medical literature described different areas where um, magnetic fields should um, be applied, especially in fractures, which is later on important, I think, for our osteoporosis um, topic. Um, Cleopatra, for example, she was wearing a magnetic um, band all the time against, um, against headache. And um, also, it's different kind of pictures in the in North and Middle America, the, native, um, the natives um, also 
um, used a lot of magnetic stones, magnetic field, different kind of steels for healing of bones, of skins, of bones. And there was different literature described in the 1800s from Mesmer, who created the whole wording around magnetism for healing. And in different kind of books where it was described that a magnetism applied in very different ways um, could support healing of skin and bones. And to better understand the um, possible principle, how it could work, and also the differences, how magnetic fields could be applied, um, I try to make a brief short summary on um, the basic principles of how um, magnetic resonant imaging works, because this describes um, the effects on a magnetic field on the body the best way. And um, the easiest comparable example is our Earth, which have an axis where the Earth once a day spins or turns around, and the Earth itself on the axis creates a magnetic field. So you have the two basic principles of each proton in the body, that the protons in the body have an axis. They have a magnetic field similar to the Earth's field, and they have a specific spin. And the difference to the Earth is that the spin is not a circular spin. It's more a spin top type of um, spin, similar to the devices um, you have as kids, the spin tops, and it normally circles this way around the axis. And these um, spin and the axis of the protons are in different locations throughout the body and throughout the different tissues. So this is a specific um, pattern for cells or for different tissues, which kind of spin and which kind of um, axis they um, have. And what an MRI is doing, and also what is the principle of all types of um, magnetic or electromagnetic therapy is two things. Number one thing is an alignment of the axis in the XY. So a 2D alignment of the axis to the magnetic field. That is the one thing, a permanent, a static, or, a, um, or also a pulsating magnet does. It's a pure, simple alignment in a two-dimensional field. This is not affecting the spin of the protons. It's only affecting the axis and the alignment in a 2D. And then the second effect, what an MRI scanner or we come later alpha therapy can do is that it can affect the spin and the um, orientation or alignment in the three dimensional axis of the proton by an electrofrequency, which is applied normally orthogonal or 180 degrees to the axis of the static magnetic field. So coming back to your spin top example, you have the spin top, which is circling. The spin top have a special angle to the static magnetic field. So in one step, you just bring it up to the dimensions, to the alignment of the magnetic field. And in the second one, you flip the spin around and it changes. And these two effects are specific for each tissue. And this is what in basic principle MRI imaging is using. So number one, it applies a static um, magnetic field. In a second step, it applies different type of radio frequency. So seeing in the imaging examples, you have number one, an alignment in the 2D axis. You have in the 3D dimension, a change of the spin and alignment. Then these things are switched off. So the protons come back to their initial position. And this is um, enhanced and can be detected by specific echo signals, this relaxation or the flip back to normal. This can be amplified, and therefore you can distinguish different kinds of tissues and the viability of tissues. 
That is the basic principle of MRI. Now, which types of these mechanism you can use for therapy? The first thing you could use is the static magnetic field. And the static magnetic field can be, as it says, static, or it can be also pulsed. So static magnet magnetic field on, static magnetic field off. Then it's called pulse, that you change the frequency of the electromagnetic field, or you can do it static. And this can be used for therapy. And most of the therapies you currently find in literature describing this static or pulsed electromagnetic field. And the name you will normally find it in literature is these pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, PEMF or PEMFT. Sorry. Um, as you see, also, I have not did PowerPoint for a long time. So, some, uh, so yeah. Um, so, the PEMF therapy is US FDA approved. So, this therapy can be um, used in US. It's used in different clinics. It's even part of a therapeutic um, pattern in different kind of diseases. And um, there are around 120 research studies on the field of the use of PEMF in the area of osteoporosis, um, um, bone healing, osteoarthritis, let's say everything around um, cartilage, bone, diseases, fractures. In a literature review, in a summary, there are strong significant results that it enhances bone healing in situation where bone healing is disrupted. So not in an osteoporosis situation, but in, in situations where um, the bone is disrupted. So small fractures, larger fractures, Psoid arthrosis when you have fractures but not really healed together, that they can enhance a bone healing in these situations. There's also studies which show effect in pain reduction or mobility in osteoarthritis patients, but these studies were never randomized controlled studies or double blinded studies. So it's more empirical descriptive studies, and um, everybody who's deeper in osteoarthritis research know how difficult it is to assess osteoarthritis research with empirical studies because the disease itself it's very difficult to stage to combine in one disease um, so the data from our view is still um, limited so for the PM pms which um, is was introduced in the late 50s there are current explanatory models, but there's also not a real proof of the one mechanism which leads to the positive effects in bone healing. This is also a very important thing. I will come back also later from the MBST data. We are still in the method I present today in a stage where we see clinical effects, where we can see significance, but where we still explore the specific effects which lead to these changes. So we have explanatory models, we have basic in vitro research articles, which give us, let's say, more security around the current explanatory models, but there's still not one pathway which can be described how it's really um, applying, let's say, the therapeutic effect currently in vivo. From the current explanatory models for a static magnetic field, so for the PEMF therapy, the so-called piezoelectrical effect is the best or let's say the most agreed model. This is a um, more, let's say, physical explanatory model that a change in certain materials, in this case, mainly tissue. So here you see the cartilage, you see the um, the bones above the cartilage in the joint, and you have the 
um, surfaces or the transitions period between cartilage and periosteum and the osteum, and you have also the cartilage interfaces. And when you change the elasticity, for example, of the cartilage by pressure, so the cartilage is compressed and going up, you create um, small electrical charges or voltages on the surface. This is the pure um, piezoelectrical effect, which was um, described in the 50s by a Japanese research group. It seems that this effect is responsible for, a, let's say, current stimulation of cartilage and bones, and let, for a normal or a healthy situation within the joint. And the explanatory model for the PEMF is that in a status where the bone is um, already injured or have decreased density or where the cartilage is injured and losing volume, that the P electrical effect is not working anymore sufficient in the joint because the el elasticity is gone. And this um, enhances the destruction in bone or cartilage. And by applying a static or especially a um, pulsating magnetic field, you create also a, um, a charge and an indirect piezoelectrical effect that by the charge, you reinforce the el elasticity of the joint, which then enhances the regeneration or the building of bone and cartilage structure. And this is also proved in different kind of animal studies where they really applied electrical pulses in the joints and measured and they really could see that the morphology was enhanced and that they could be regenerated. And therefore they expect that this is the main model why PMF works so well, for example, in bone healing because the two sides of the bone the effect is created and that enhances the bone healing. And they also assume that this is the reason why positives result in osteoporosis or osteoarthritis are seen. The second current explanatory model why a static or pulsating magnetic field um, could influence um, um, the treatment is that you have around 2% of ionic molecules in the body, especially supporting nutrition in the bone. Um, I also joined your YouTube channel, which is really interesting after you sent and heard a few of the presentation to get a little bit uh, more in detail on osteoporosis and understood that nutrition is a very important field also. And saying this, that this field is important, it's also important that these ionic molecules going to the position where they needed to, to create maybe the positive effect also in the bone. And um, there's a therapy theory that the magnetic field um, changes the ionic molecules to maybe better connect or better used for these processes. And there's also different research studies who could show that um, calcium level increases, kalium, different kinds of level are increased by applying the magnet magnetic field, but there's not a direct connection done that this really led to, let's say, increase of um, density in the bone or better cartilage, but you could just see that they are increased and based on the mechanism that they are needed, there is um, an assumption that this is one of the effects why the magnetic field could um, lead to these um, positive effects. A third mechanism, which is also described um, by different research groups is, that the ionic transport in the cells through the membrane is changed or improved by the magnetic field. But from, the, um, from research studies done on the membrane and on applying magnetic fields, it's in all of the studies which were done and I um, reviewed, there could never be really seen that a static or pulsating magnetic field could really change membrane voltage or transportation because the magnetic field itself it's not um, strong enough and it's only due to this two-dimensional 
um, effect, a real electromagnetic transfer could not be seen. But um, there's one study which showed changes in the um, adenosine and adenosine three phosphate, which are also important in the role of osteoclasts and osteoblasts, which are dependent on the ionic transfer, and they were increased. That was the reason why they thought it could be connected. But the, this was never um, really proven or um, followed up. That's the reason I mark this point, but um, in our view, we could not really find that this should be the explanatory model on the, on the research we found. And then the fourth mechanism, which is now, let's say the most en vogue, anyhow to explain, um, let's say um, deconstruction of cells or inflammatory processes is the so-called radical pair mechanism. So intracellular changes of excit excitation level of water in the cells, this leads to, let's say, an imbalance of the cell, how the electrons are connected to HTO, um, to water. So there's some um, called triplet. So a lot of electrons on some of the water, only one electron of one of the water. So radicals are created. And, um, and these radicals um, are seen as one basic um, starting point for all. Um, injury processes. And um, it's also, there was an assumption that these PM, PMF potentially could affect this excitation to bring it back to a normal stage in this radical pair mechanism. And that this is the main reason why it works. But um, here, I'm, I would say I'm more clear that this cannot work because you need to have the resonance of the spin of the proton to have, an to have an intracellular change of the excitation. And a static magnetic field based on the principle I showed cannot affect the spin of the proton and cannot create the resonance in the cell to have these excitation um, level. And that's the basic reason where um, the former um, founder entrepreneur um, of MBST company um, patented and started the MBST technique. So in addition to the static magnetic field, which is used in the PFM therapy, he applied an additional radio frequency, 90 degrees orthogonal to the static field. And therefore he creates a spin energy, which is in the same resonance. So the um, spin in the cell has the same resonance that is applied by the electrofrequency. And then you can make an energy transfer to the spin of the proton. And then you can affect also intracellular changes. And for sure, as I said, I would send you a paper, but this is the basic difference between these PEFM kind of therapies and the MBST type of therapy. This means the MBST has all effects that the PEFM therapy has, but in addition, it also creates the resonance effect in the cell where energy can be transferred in the cell and can change excitation levels in the cells of the protons and can therefore um, work on different kind of signal inducing processes in the cells. And there it creates the effects on the cellular level. And here's an example how it looks. Um, this is the machine. It's um, you lie on the machine. And you see you have the two components. You have on the one, the sweep coil, which creates a static magnetic field around the area where you do the therapy. And you have 90 degrees, the RF coils, which create the um, electrofrequency impulse for the spin. And these frequency, the radio frequency, can be adapted for the spe specific tissue or for the specific disease area which are changing a little bit in the frequency where it can um, have the same resonance. 
And this is applied for therapy in the machines. So I would say this is the basic principle of how an MBST machine works. What we expect as um, the effect that it creates in the cell. And I hopefully gave some kind of a comparison to the PFM therapy because it's really important when you start reading afterwards, it's very confusing in Google and everywhere because these terminology is used always very mixed up. And, um, and if you continue to follow up these things, I think it's very important to, to just know these differences and check where it is to better understand the research work. Not saying one is good or bad, but better understand when you read about research outcomes, where they come from and which effects um, most likely these therapy also um, um, treats. So to the scientific background. So this technique was introduced in the late 19th, beginning of 2000. And since then, there's, I would say only three basic research articles done where in an in vitro setup, the um, MBST technique was applied to cells. And um, this effect was measured in the cells. And um, these are also the three papers I will, I will send to Shelley and everybody could read for, for interest. Um, the first paper was um, about, um, they just wanted to check number one, if there's any adverse effects. So the main question was if the NMR have any um, negative effects on the cell like apoptosis or less viability. That was the main question what, what they did and if they have any other findings. And um, the outcome was that um, there is no apoptosis, no changes in um, viability. Even the group treated um, was longer viability than the non-treated group and less cases of later apoptosis. But in addition, what they found is a significant proliferation of chondrocytes and osteoblasts in the study, which was not the real question they asked, but when they published, they focused also on the proliferation of chondrocytes and osteoblasts because they, um, um, they saw this huge effect. And um, in this article, they only described it and could not find an explanatory model for the proliferation. And um, the second article was done by an Austrian research group. And um, they found, um, they more looked on a signal inducing level and they used interleukin one better one better because it's one of the um, of the signal enhancers for inflammatory diseases in joint. So I don't think it's very much about interleukin and all the processes, but you have a lot of these, you know, enhancing proteins in the cascade, which lead to an inflammatory process, or which lead to the growth of um, cells, or to different, you know, mechanisms. And it looks like that these signal inducing or on an mRNA and a, a stage later, that these um, proteins are the one which really affected by the technique. And we need to find out now more in detail, you know, how they really affect the disease later on. And um, also saying this, we, we currently not have an answer yet, but one of the things we did when we, when we joined the company and also um, enhanced now in spring that we went back to the sites with made the basic research studies, and we supported them now to do more basic research on, on, on these because um, we really want to understand much more about these, um, these, these processes. But the positive thing and why also when we entered, we believe in this technique is you could clearly significant find these changes in control groups, they changed the medium, even stronger than effects with corticoids. So they have now a new studies which will be published end of this year, where they com compared it to corticosteroids in the effect, which are known to bring down inflammatory and different things. And the effect of the um, 
of the MBST technique was um, higher and more significant than the corticosteroid changes, which is um, from the data I saw yet, we saw the presentation a good months before was for me the strongest data I ever saw on, on the technique itself currently. So the summary for me of this one is, um, there is in in vitro cells, scientific papers, which prove that the NMR creates an effect within these cells, which is measurable by proliferation of cells and by changes in the signal inducing processes. Then due to the anti-inflammatory effect, and I would also say due to the um, fact that osteoarthritis is, is one of the diseases where you have very limited non-surgical or non-drug treatment options, um, they applied the technique first in osteoarthritis for research studies. And um, I'm also emphasizing this point because the company itself or also the founder never had a research strategy on his product. So he never had a real hypothesis how the product works and tried to prove it by research studies. He just invented the machine. Some research group liked what they found and then other people start to get interested and start to do research on it. So um, everything where MBST now stands is based on results of what people had and they continued to use it. It was never a real structured plan how, how this um, was developed. And, and osteophritis was the area where the first research groups entered. And um, I will send you this review article because it just came out recently and it summarized in my view in an excellent way all the research which was done over the last 15 years in this area. And, um, and the first important thing is there's no randomized study with a control group available. So all clinical data I will show you tonight is empirical, is um, at the end case study based. They use parameters, they measured. It's very promising results, but currently we have no randomized studies with control groups available. And um, saying this, it's clear that this is one thing we are now currently planning because it's key for us to do this type of studies um, now for long-term um, use and um, to find medical patterns, how it can be used for treatment. Currently, we, there are 28 republished articles and seven of them are really um, significant um, um, and these were included in the review. And as I said, it's empirical data. It's mainly on clinical sc scores. And in addition, there were different imaging um, scores also done, but it's mainly about pain, mobility, so improvements in clinical sc scores. And as I'm um, saying very promising results with significant changes, even in large groups of 4,500 patients, you could see huge effects in, in, an, in an improved range of most motion when they use the machines in better mobility, um, in better clinical scores, which is if you compare to other research um, done in these areas, let's say better than the normal, but as said in the beginning, no randomized studies with control group. So it could be a plus, super placebo effect. Still, this is not um, proven. Just to give you, let's say the three most significant findings, the improvement of the mobility and pain scores ranged from 60 up to 80%. So only to show how significant the changes were using the machines. Um, we're not talking about smaller changes. Um, it's even more changes than applying um, um, NSAA drugs in patients regularly. But on the other hand, also these were not compared to the technique. The pain um, reduction was constant. And it's also proven that it's in a period about eight weeks to six months after therapy. So you see, you apply the therapy, there's, let's say up to six weeks, then around eight weeks after you started therapy, you see 
these results. They even continue to improve up to six months. And then it looks like they stay stable for a year period. And then these results are, um, it looks like they get deteriorated or um, minimum um, stay maximum stable after a one year period. And um, recently, there was one <laughs> randomized double blinded trial that in the dogs, and it was only 28 dogs with lameness, and um, scores are more difficult to assess. But um, I, I want to present the data because it clearly gives us a right way how to go in future studies in vivo. So what they did, they just choose a group of osteoarthritis dogs, which have a specific kind of lameness. Um, then they did OTE, they did outcome scores, combination of pain scores, forces measurements, how to measure the lameness of the dog. And they combined it in a score, which they done pre-treatment. Um, and then did this, this uh, measurements in, in different time points afterwards and add also a range of motion analysis. And um, what was seen, you see here, um, the let's say treated and non-treated group after um, eight weeks and after three months. And um, the P is the one with no treatment. You see after um, eight weeks, the median is a little bit better than before, but it could be due to 14 dogs um, it was not significant differ, differing, um, but after um, after the three months period, um, the the OTE score went down as a significant compared to the um, initial to the starting point without treatment. And if you see now on the right side, the eight weeks were non significant, no real changes. But after the um, three months period, there was a significant improvement of the OTE in these. Um, in these docs, but you see the variation. It's only a median change, and you need a larger sample size um, to let's say, reassess and um, get more significant results in these patients. In a summary, this is only the published articles, and um, we have much more reviews of patients which reporting these. So the company currently lives from word of mouth of people who like the treatment, who, um, who feel a significant improvement and um, of the treatment or doctors who see this improvement in patients. And then it starts to create step-by-step -step a society now using this and more and more patients are included. We try to follow up as many patients as possible with scores. Each of our doctors um, in Germany um, have score sheets and we try to follow up these patients to get more data also for us, which um, underlines these positive effects of, of treatment. And now I just wanna show a few slides on what are most of the research studies about that you get a feeling uh, what these research studies about. And this is also a, an example of um, a doctor in Germany from the University Hospital in Dresden. Um, it's a case of osteochondrosis dissecans. So um, I don't know if everybody is aware, but it's a an, um, it's an disease um, underlying the cartilage surface where the bone gets lost and it's um, like an osteochondral defect, which get loosened. You see it here. That's a defect hole. Here's a cartilage. Here's a bone. And you see here the, the defect area. It's seen here very well. So this doctor had these type of patients. He heard about the um, technique. He was one of the early ones who are consultants of the entrepreneur who tested it, the university professor. Then what he did, he just made a rescan after a few months to see after conservative treatment, how the lesion develops. So they just did conservative treatment without drug, without surgery. Um, he nearly found the same size as before. Um, then they started to apply um, the um, MBST treatment. And you see here that the defect is nearly gone. 
you still have some fluid in the joint, so you still see that the cartilage is highly affected due to the osteochondrosis desiccans, but it looks like that the osteochondral defect is um, improved. You also see clearly already on this picture the weakness. This is empirical, so you see it's not the same type of MRI sequences. It's not, you know, one by one with different steps. So he just had to found it, this, this thing and he said, oh, it's amazing. He never saw an effect. And now he's using it in all his osteochondrosis desiccans patients and he have very good results, but he's not really publishing it. He's just using it in his patients. And, um, and this is the best description where MBST stands currently. The doctors who are using it, they're fully convinced they're using, they have excellent results, but it, it's not really out there or there's not really part of a standard medical, you know, people believe in it or not believe in it. And the people believe we get super feedbacks like this and um, positive feedbacks of patients, um, but it's still in a, not really there and people know and aware about it, or it's also not really defined how it should be standardized use. I see now seven chat things. Should yes. I? Yes, there's a lot in the chat. <laughs> Um, Maybe I go a little bit through the questions. It's okay, or that sure, I'm more sure. active for you. So mm -hmm. this is what weight bearing does. Yeah, exactly. This is also one of the mechanisms why they believe that weight bearing is the piezoelectrical effect. Why weight bearing could enhance this bone that you know the movement um, and in the joint, especially in early stage stages. Yeah. Does also, I assume, yes, it's the same thing that um, as a student answered, uh, Henrik already answered, exactly. And it's, as I said, you know, the more it's destructive, the less um, normal weight bearing can affect it. And therefore, maybe a combination therapy could be very useful. I come later to this question, but um, could PF, PFM therapy help someone with small fiber neuropathy? <laughs> Honestly, cannot give you a, a scientific proven answer. Um, we, I can give you one answer. We now just published a study of MBST um, from Vienna University, where it shows a significant improvement in the growth of Schwann cells, so the surrounding cells and neuron, and also in defects, uh, a better healing and alignment. The question stays if it's only due to the magnetic or static effect or if it's due to the resonance effect in the cells. And therefore it's difficult to answer the questions. I, from you know what we saw, we believe it's more due to the resonance effect, but potentially it could be also done by PEMF. And one additional point to the neuropathy, um, the our biggest single country, um, where MBST is used is Spain. And um, in Spain, the neuro card, so the, the special frequency for neuro is now the biggest seller. So the ones where it's mostly ordered by the doctors because they have a lot of um, neuropathia patients where they applied it and it was the only treatment with, which worked. And they just use it because it works so well in these areas where you have nearly no treatment option instead of pain. So it looks like that there is an effect. And if it's due to the static or due to the MBST technique, we cannot really say now. We clearly believe from our studies that it's more due to the resonance effect in the cells, but it's very hard to, I don't have an answer yet. Maybe I come back in three years and we can give you more data, but currently it's very difficult. I hope you answered the same, Henrik. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does this treatment increase osteoblast? Yes. Yeah, that was founded in the um, increase osteoblast. Yeah, that was found in the one study. But um, as I said, it's an in vitro study where a different thing was tested, and we don't have additional data where this was. It's also something where I think we need more research data on. Uh, may I ask a question also, Dr. Sure, please. Yeah, um, sure. I was please. just wondering, 
uh, you had a slide that showed the piezo electrical effect and um, and I was just wondering on that particular slide, um, is that the cartilage that is um, really getting affected in that particular example? For the piezo electrical effect, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's a it's a surf. It's so so. It's mainly the periostom which gets the charge, the skin between the bone and the cartilage, because the bone and the cartilage have the elastic effect, mm -hmm. and the 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 membrane in the middle gets mainly the the pure the, the the piezo electrical effect. That's the reason why it's believed that it both stimulates bone and cartilage. Because it's not in the tissue, it's on the surface or the boundary between the two tissues. Okay. And there was one question now came up from Stephanie, um, what it takes for FDA approval. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very good question. So it's, uh, there's two things. So number one, you know, there's a class one or class two FDA approval. A class one approval is that you can use the device in the US, so everybody can use it, but there's no medical indication to use it. So no reimbursement, not part of the therapy. So it's, um, it's like you're allowed to use it, similar like a lot of countries in Europe also, that you know, you just allowed to use it. it. It only have to be super safe, no harming the patients. And this class one is what we now targeting as first step. And, so, oh, um, sorry. <laughs> yes, please. Ask. I, I was going to ask you if that's the case, uh, is there any idea that you have what the cost might be to the individual if insurance won't cover it? Um, yeah, so I can only give you a little bit an idea how it works now in Germany and UK. <laughs> so, and Wait. I think it should be similar. So, in Germany and UK, the costs are currently bet between 1,000 and 1,500 euro per patient. It depends a little bit on the, for the 10 treatment cycles. I so see. seven to 10 or nine, it depends a little bit. In Spain, it's a little, um, um, a little cheaper, um, maybe around 800, um, but it, that's uh, the range and currently, there's no country where it's reimbursed, so it's fully private. I see. And and Germany is the first country where in the new um, reimbursement schedule, the therapy has already number. So it will be the first country where it will become part of the, let's say, medical treatment numbers, which can be reimbursed. Not saying that it will be reimbursed and it's another decision, but it's still accepted as a medical treatment. And getting okay. these numbers, which is the first step you need to get be reimbursed. All right, thank you. But for but um, from what we had already discussion for US, so what we see as realistic is that we target the class one registration. Mm -hmm. That with the class one registration, we could do the same type of setups we have now in Europe, and that more people can assess the technique. And parallel, we run. Um, controlled studies. So when we apply for class one, we will be also transparent with FDA that we want to have also a class two approval. We will get some hints and guidelines how which kind of data we need. And then we will choose one or two specific areas where we see um, the highest probability to get in short time enough data. And then we would target the class two registration in US or talking about Europe to get more um, let's say medical indication and in reimbursement of insurance companies. Okay, thank you. Question, yeah. um, how, has there been any research done either empirically or meta-analysis to show how this differ, would differ in a patient that was on medication versus doing this type of treatment? Yeah, it's very, as I said, these really, to use the groups clean, nobody did it yet. So it's yes. very hard to assess okay. which other treatments they did. So for example, for this osteochondrosis dissecans patients, even if it's more case studies, what is good in these patients is the same doctor, he treats them the same way. 
Um, he's doing conservative treatment for a certain period. He, he's, he's doing the thing before he's doing surgery. And also there's a few patients he cannot help where he's do surgery afterwards. So he's mm -hmm. more, even if it's a small group not published, his results mm -hmm. are more reliable. Um, for the other groups, it's very difficult. Maybe one of the patients is losing weight of the osteotritis patient. One is using more drugs. This is not right. really assessed because yeah. it's retros retrospective empirical data. So it's not... Sure. Um, but, but I mean, yeah. in terms of like how many people have gone through this treatment, do you see any changes in their bone DEXA scans? I, I come later. I have a few slides on them. Okay. So I have oh, one slide oh, on I'm this sorry. One. Yeah. I didn't realize you... No, no, I have... Go no, no, I have one slide. slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. I only wanted to answer a few questions of you. You asked only a question if it helps with labrum tears. Um, normally, I would say it can help in tissues, but um, being a surgeon and seeing labrum tears, there it's a mechanical disruption. So you can only heal if you bring them back together. So it's more, uh, you know, you can never heal things which are too far away from each side because you know the cells cannot jump. So maybe minor tears, which are still connected, could be potentially because all tissue could be have these effects. But for sure, the more it's a mechanical distress of the tear, the less any kind of regeneration can work. It's the same in a late stage osteoarthritis. You cannot do new cartilage with this technique. It's a similar, you know, you need the tissues connected to, to go. Can you discuss here yeah, later on? I'm coming to the question of Lorraine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If it's used for whole body treatment. Yeah. yeah. So here's another of these cases, but you see the same. You see this huge bone bruises, the white one, which shows a huge bone affection before treatment. And then six weeks after and 12 weeks after treatment, you see the significant reduction of the of these bone bruises. But coming back to what you said, it could still be that he used the medication at home. You know, it's not followed up, it's case studies. But still, these results are not one. I've talked to the doctor um, before in Dresden because we want to conduct a study with him on these patients. And he see, he, he's so convinced of the technique because it's really, um, he's seeing it regularly in his patients. So it's a standard treatment now for osteochondrosis disciplines and for, for bone bruises after a sport injury. So now I'm coming back to your questions. Um, first to the DEXA. So what's the current status in osteoporosis? So in osteoporosis, there's only one group in Croatia, the group of Professor um, Krepan, I hope I pronounce him the right name, um, in, in Zagreb, Croatia. Um, he's a professor there of the rheumatology um, orthopedic clinic. And um, he assessed in 103 patients um, how bone density and um, the osteocalcin changes after treatment um, with the NR, with the um, nuclear magnetic resonance therapy. Again, no control group. <laughs> so we just can see the changes in this group. And um, I think for treatment, you know, better in osteoporosis, for sure, these patients could do additional treatment, which he not covers. But in his protocol and how they documented, they all got the same type of treatment. So they all had a T-score be less than 2.5 before they entered, minus 2.5 before they entered. And they all had minimum one year of vitamin D treatment. And they continued this treatment also afterwards. And what was not measured is um, physical activity, which is, we all know, very important in osteoporosis patients and which could make a difference. What was also not really adjusted was BMI type or these things, which also affect mobility and maybe have an impact. Um, but um, beside this, um, what was encouraging in the 103 patients, he, um, he exercised with the technique. He saw a significant um, improvement of the bone density in all areas measured. And he saw a significant effect on an increase of the osteocalcin in these patients measured. Clearly seen, um, significant. And, um, and this is, I think, 
for our discussion today, let's say is a very promising base to think about how to use it and um, and how to better evaluate also these techniques. Um, and there I come to the second article he made. Unfortunately, he could only do a case report study because after he had this very good results, he um, he treated a lot of patients with his techniques if of most of his patients because he just saw the results and said it can only be beneficial to the patients to edit because it's non-harming. So the worst what could happen is if it not works, but it's non-harming. But seeing this good results, he could improve it. And then he made a case report study on, on 450 patients who were treated. So um, a bigger number. And he used fractures at an outcome statement, which we know is the most let's say, important outcome for the osteoporosis patient. Again, no comparison to any control group. He just described what he, what he, see, what he saw. And what he mainly saw was that there were only two fractures in the first six months, and one of them was clearly to a severe injury, which would lead to a fracture. And he saw no fractures between six months and um, one year after treatment, and even a reduced um, number of fractures afterwards. And the main thing he described here was 11 patients which have a severe trauma seen by hematoma in the clinic coming in without a fracture in areas where normally there's a high probability of fractures in osteoporotic patients. And in these, he also measured T-scores which were significantly improved. And therefore, he, he stated that the data indicates that the technique not only can increase bone density, it might also reduce the fracture risk. So really, maybe not only working on the density, also working on architectural changes or elasticity changes of the bone. And um, clearly, um, from also what I read, this, I think it's a key point to for a treatment modality or for a new treatment modality who could add something in osteoporosis treatment, if it could really enhance this architecture elasticity by building up density with the technique. And that was um, what he could describe in his, um, article, in, in his article. On the other hand, this is the only two articles where it was used in osteoporosis patients. And, um, and that's where we currently stay also. And we currently planning a study in osteoporosis. Uh, but um, also here we love, we already discussed it with um, Lorraine. We also still need input because um, it's very difficult to make these fracture studies and you know how to apply with control groups. And so we need to find the right way what we really want to measure to have most significant you know, result in these patients. We're still um, elaborating this what which endpoints we try to find out and work with research groups to really we want to do it also multi-center the study to really have more effects and more clinical data and more different kind of ways to measure it to get the best idea what it really improves if it shows an effect in osteoporosis and in addition there's a various numbers of case report studies so to osteoporosis patients who increase bone density or 10 patients in the clinic who had a better DEXA for seed score, all these types. But I think the, it was patient between two and 10, 12. So you cannot really use the data. But in all of these patients, you saw improvement when it was measured, applying the therapy. Significant. So in all of these patient groups. And um, and interesting, and this is a little bit the, the end of the, the, the slides, is that um, Professor um, Kripan then um, wrote an article last year where he summarized from all literature and from all experience in his patients, what would his proposal currently to use the technique? And his proposal is that he said, that he's saying for patients who have an increased risk of osteoarthritis or osteoporosis, in these patients who are using patients with sport injuries or who have the risk of osteoporosis, in combination with regular exercises, he's applying the MBST once per year, five to 10 times. 
because he thinks it's a prevention from the data he has. And, um, and this is a big area, I think, especially the prevention area, because clearly everything you do on a cellular level, the earlier you target, the better results you have for the long-term outcome. The later you target, the more you fight against a lot of other diseases. Then he recommends that for patients with osteoarthritis um, to do it also once a year with exercise, but potentially adding pain relief therapy or evaluating if this could be um, instead of pain relief drug, which is in my view, the first study we have to do, we have to compare it with pain relief, with NSAA drugs, because they are proven anti-inflammatory and anti-pain. And if we see similar results, I think that's a pathway to go with the technique as it's not harming and non-invasive. And he say for later or severe, he would even do it twice a year. Um, this is something, as I said, severe late osteoarthritis is no cartilage. Um, fully inflammatory, so it could be only an anti-inflammatory effect, which is done by the technique mainly. And um, but he's recommending this. It's something we need to discuss. But then the last point, um, which is interesting for our discussion, what he's saying: if he have patients with um, osteoporosis where it's already a, 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 a T score is is negative or in risk, he would clearly recommend these ten days of MBST. And um, he's believing and giving it to all of this osteoporosis patients. And this may be the point where we can start discussion that there's, um, there is already a clinic or an area of patients where based on the data he has and on his clinical experiences, he see it's beneficial to add it to current treatment strategies and that it's, this is an add-on for the patient. And, and this may be to Lorraine's question, the last slide. Um, this was the machine we had before, which you see can only address specific regions in the body. And this is the full body treatment we have now, where you can, especially in cases of osteoporosis, where you want to target the full um, area, not like in osteoarthritis, maybe only one joint, you can do a full treatment cycle in these patients. And in our view, this would be long-term if we use it in osteoporosis, the recommended machines that you really do a full treatment um, to improve the um, osteo situation in the body. Currently, the machines we use are mainly this one, which do a more regional treatment. So you maybe have to do one or two cycles in different areas where you address. So spine for, um, because it's a higher risk of spine fractures and then maybe um, hip, pelvic, and forearm, or the areas where you see most of the fractures or most impact on, on the osteoporosis. Um, and that's my last slide for that's tonight. Great. That's great. Um, let me come up with you here. Okay. That was so good. And it was so. Um, so complex. And uh, you know, I have to say, I, I want to watch this again, because there is just so much to it. I, I wonder uh, if we have more questions that people want to ask you. Um, I'm sure there are. But one thing that I also wanted to ask you is, if someone undergoes this in Germany or Europe, or any of the other places where it's yeah. being used, mm -hmm. What is the process? Um, I see the machine, but how, and you said that the treatment is 10 times. Is that yeah. 10, 10 days in a row? Or? It's, it's still normally, I think 10 days in a row, I would not, we not recommend. We, we recommend once a week, once every three, four days. It also depends a little bit on the setup. It's sometimes used in rehabilitation clinics where you only have patients for two weeks, then you try that, why I say five to 10 times, then they try to apply it every second day, like five times, six times. Um, when you have, um, let's say clinical situation, they currently use it also a lot after um, replacement surgery to, to enhance osteointegration of the implants. 
They also use the clinic time, so they try to apply it more regular. In the osteoporosis and osteoarthritis patients from the clinics I talk to, they mainly do it once a week for 10 weeks, but sometimes only for seven weeks. It depends how long the patient comes. That's the reason we have this five to 10 range. And also in all of the studies we've done before, we applied minimum five, sometimes seven, sometimes eight. The results look similar. We saw a little longer effect when we treated longer. Um, and maybe it's also a question Liz can answer for UK because I'm not, maybe it's, we never talked how, if you do the same scheme in UK or how often you, but that's what I, from the clinics I talked to where it's, where it's research, um, that's around what, how it should be done. So if you would ask me today to, to test it, um, I would say 10 times every week from the mechanism that the body can enhance sounds, sounds good. But um, for example, if you would come now, if you have osteoporosis, you would come for two weeks to Europe for a trip and you want to test it. I, I would clearly say from the data we have is efficient if you would do it every second day, six times already, and you will already have an in effect. And, and for sure, we have to evaluate a little bit better how long-term the effect is. And uh, um, From a UK point of view, um, I've been working with the technology now for 12 years. And throughout the UK, we have doctors, um, orthopedic consultants, surgeons, physiotherapists, chiropractors, osteopaths. MBST has sort of brought everybody together in being able to use the technology. Um, we have found it very effective on using once a day for seven to nine sessions. And all our patients get fantastic results with that. With regards to osteoporosis, we don't currently have the osteo spin in the UK um, that's about to change very soon within the next few months as a lot of our current clinics are very excited about this, um, the full body bed. And um, it would be good to work out exactly, but it, it's safe, MBST is safe. So if you're having an hour a day for 10 days to get the results, if someone comes over from the US for treatment, which they do do, um, we could, you can even do two in a day with four hours of rest time between and still get good results with the treatment and you know safe um there are no known side side effects that never have been for the last well since 1998 um the only thing is some patients might get a better night's sleep than they have done in a long time um during treatment and even in the first few days you know patients can feel somewhat a bit of ease and um yeah. you know it, it, it you don't necessarily have to wait wait all that time to start feeling the benefit well, would the technology um, be of any harm to someone who didn't need it? No. no. So especially, no, so that's not. So I normally say a treatment which have no side effects cannot be a treatment <laughs> because, you know, if it really affects something, it has to be a side effect. Mm -hmm. um, but as let's say an MRI is using so wide, that's the reason why you get these class one approval FDA so fast. Um, and it's proven in so many imaging indications and the MSC that you never find that it harms patient in any direct way. And from the radical pair mechanism itself, because it only affects the mechanism if you're in an imbalance situation, um, normally it should not affect or harm any, you know, viable. The only potential risk could be um, special types of cancers in special phases where they get a reorganization mm -hmm. potentially okay um but again you need to have it in this place and it's very difficult to assess but this could be the only if but it can from our view it have to be super repetitive to have these type of effects of of, of mm -hmm. vascularization because we only enhance regular pr processes of of enhance of, of is, but is, as let's say we, we never have and we had this discussion we had just an approval in saudi arabia which have a super strong fda and we had to show all these harming results and from the mri and it's clear that never something was found that's the reason you can even have three or seven tesla machines so if you see an mri scanner it's something i not mentioned so um, we have um, 0.2 milli tesla and um, so a very low magnetic field and a regular scanner have many, many times higher magnetic fields and um, electrofrequencies. And, you know, the physics are it's significant increasing the effect in, in the cells short term. 
and they never had any adverse effects. And for example, especially for 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 brain cancer, it's the method of choice, and never something was done. So we are very confident that we won't find any any harms or any changes. Yeah, and it's uh, it's not as loud, I would imagine, in that regard as well. You know, MRI exactly. can be quite loud. Exactly, but that's so. If you compare it, it's no noises because you don't have any, you know, gradients or any imaging mm -hmm. you need. It's um, that you need no extra rooms. You need no shielding. You mm -hmm. can use any implants close because the magnet is so, and you don't even need a specific medical personnel to treat it. You know, you it's, it's very easy. So you could put it in your home. You know, it's for clear not something for your home but it could be easily there and not affect any people around. It's only when it's run giving these uh, magnet and the electrofrequency impulse. And it's uh, and it's interesting with the noise. Some people ask us to add noise because some patient want to hear something when they treat it because they not believe it's a treatment when they not hear something or a light. So it's really a lot of doctors ask us if we can add something that the people see the treatment. <laughs> We always add a card where you see the frequency, but um, this type of um, of question, yeah. That's funny. Uh, let me see if there's other questions here. I don't mean to. Yeah, know. there was a question. I think one very. Uh, it's a question of um, Justine. Um, it, in Spain or in Germany, if medical doctors or physical therapists um, performing and subscribing these treatments. It's it, it's interesting because it also depends on countries. You know, in Germany, it's only doctors. So it has to be a doctor who subscribes the treatment. In Spain, it's a lot of physiotherapists because um, in Spain, the physiotherapy is a very strong market and there's very um, huge clinics and the physiotherapists are similar to the US system. In Germany, it's not a part of a real university system to become a physiotherapist. And um, so it seems higher educated than people trust more. So physiotherapists are used. And for example, in Dubai, it's fully privately run. They run like, a, let's say, more like a spa, and everybody can go there. You can go there if you want by yourself, or a doctor recommend you the treatment. So it depends a lot on 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 the local um, on the local, let's say, surrounding. But I would always recommend. Uh, um, a, 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 a doctor and a physiotherapist because especially in the current stage this is not a one-shot treatment you need to understand the whole disease you need to understand the other treatments a person is doing you know we're not talking about the wonder button here but we talk about uh, in my view an, an, an excellent supplement to different therapies and um, and and in osteoarthritis and osteoporosis maybe even filling a gap which was never really possible to treat but you need to understand the full thing. You need to understand the patient. And therefore, um, you need somebody who's taking care of the patient, let's say this, whoever is doing this in the, in the setup of, of the country. And, um, and the other question Henrik already asked, answered in US, we not have studies, but we need for the FDA approval, but there's no studies done yet. Unfortunately, no machine. The question of Switzerland available, Henrik answered it. Um, already, but the new web page will also have a um, something you can search in each country where the machines are, so everybody knows where to find machines. So we try to want to because we more and more see people ask for it because the interest is increasing, and then we want to offer the best what we can have, you know, where where, where these um, machines are. And the equipment looks quite large. Similar to MRI, it's not as large as an MRI. It looks bigger than it is, <laughs> but it's like a, um, the the full system is like let's say a, a dinner table for for six people. So for sure you have to lie. It's like a table where a normal person can lie on, and then it has the the two magnets around. Um, the 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 more open system is also like a dinner table with only the two plates, and then for osteoarthritis you also have smaller systems where you can just sit and you have the coil around your knee around which are um, much um, smaller. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, let's see. Okay. So interesting. Uh, let's see. How long is A, this a session? An, an hour? 45 minutes an hour. Mm. Because you pulse it also to have a treatment. 
Okay. But as Liz said, the people are some people sleep, or some people can read, or it's like you know, some hearing the newest Netflix. podcast, or <laughs> yeah. because you can do everything beside it. That's a good thing, you know. You don't have the noise, you cannot, you can put your earphones also in, it's no problem. So that's that's great. Um and we have milli Tesla and it's Tesla. So it's, it's, it's a big difference, but I can send it. I have a little larger presentation. I send, I compare one by one, you know, how these systems are used. So you can share with everyone here. Yeah. If you had radiation therapy in the past, sure. So there's, as I said, it's not harming and there's no contraindication in terms of where you cannot use it. The question is for sure always, if you have a radiation therapy in a special tissue, is something in the tissue already destroyed where the resonance effect cannot apply? This could be the question, but I don't have a real scientific answer to this. But for example, if you have just a, a radiation therapy in a specific area and you treat another one, I would see no things. And in terms of a contraindication or harming, I, we also don't see any reason why this should be interfering. Yeah. This was very interesting. Uh, does anyone else have one more question? I don't want to, it's already well, probably 1.30 in uh, Germany right now, 2.30, maybe. 2.30, yeah. 2.30, oh my gosh. Yes. So um, we don't, we're, we're so appreciative of your time uh, doing it at this time yeah. today. Um, thank yeah. you so much for sharing. I, I hope it was not too much information. It was also difficult for me a little bit to to summarize because you need some background. But you know, it's. But I hope you got a first view and and hopefully you felt that we really see it now as a long way. We want to bring it yeah. to the treatment and um, and being here saying I would love to be in two years here and present real data and discuss about how it can be used and about feedback and because we want to learn and even if it's. As I said, I'm in two positions. I really think this is something super interesting to learn more about. And if it could fill this gap in treatment and add something, it could be making a huge impact. And we should just try to get the best data and use it the right way. And um, I think it's very exciting. And, I, you know, if you come to Boston and look to advocate yes. among our professionals down here and in, in the hospitals yeah. here, give us... No, that's work. anyhow one plan we have with the FDA we will because I have still a lot of contacts in Boston and I will target a few research groups in US and we'll present to get a better idea where to conduct a study you know what where the current research is mm -hmm. on I'm pretty sure that also people in US will elaborate these techniques because you know they're reading articles so we need to understand where maybe we have overlap and because as we said we really want to be also bring it to the market now that patients can use it because that's the long-term um, success and find the right strategy well we wish you a lot of luck because we'd love to try it over here so. yeah, yeah i would love to bring it there that everyone can try it so that we are on the way to do it and as i said currently you can only do it in europe or middle east but yes when you pass by maybe try and get your own experience i know we'll have to have a field trip <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>